Well, good morning, Victor Community Church. It's so good to see everyone here this morning. My name is Alex. just want to invite you, if you would, stand with us. Um, I want to read uh, scripture as we begin this morning, just um, to encourage us as we enter in. Um, we're actually going to introduce a new song. I'm excited to get to share this with you today as we enter into our time of worship. And uh, this, this verse out of Romans is Paul sharing with the church in Rome. And he's sharing this encouragement with them. Paul has had an incredible journey in sharing the gospel, and it's been one that's been full of trials, and he's been imprisoned and all of these things, and he's coming against resistance. But he shares this with the church, and it's the same encouragement that we have today in verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And if you're here this morning and you have experienced that hope in Jesus, how many of you have seen God show up in mighty ways in your life? Amen, that's awesome. You've seen him show up in in ways probably that you haven't even noticed, or maybe years have gone by and you've looked back and go, oh my goodness, that's God showed up in amazing ways. It's amazing to think just the power of the gospel in each one of our lives and our stories and and how God has shown up in mighty ways. And that is just, in my mind, something worthy to celebrate, something that we should sing about this morning. So we're going to sing this song. And the chorus just sings out this simple phrase, all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name, I believe. Let's lift his name high this morning. Never be ashamed 
cries How could I ever walk away From the one who saved my life I will never be ashamed Of the gospel of Jesus Christ How could I ever walk away From the one who saved my life oh, oh, No, I'll never be ashamed Of the gospel of Jesus Christ could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Oh, praise, oh. Oh, praise to God the Father. Oh, praise to Christ the Son. Oh, praise to the Holy Spirit. How God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. Jesus' mighty name, I believe. Oh, praise. Oh, praise to God the Father. Oh, praise to Christ the Son. Oh, praise to the Holy Spirit. How God praise this morning. Now raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Sleep the praise. And I raise a hallelujah
the seas that are shaken and surged, heavy gone from my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well.
just the voices. And you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. just so in awe of you. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of all of our praise, God. You are worthy of our entire lives. Lord, help us to keep you at the center of our lives, that everything we do and say would come from that place of knowing you, because you are worthy, Lord. We thank you this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, before you take a seat, if you would, um, turn to somebody, uh, tell them good morning, happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, we'll have announcements coming up here in just a second. Top of the morning to you. <laughs> Happy St. Patrick's Day, um, whatever that means. But uh, I see a lot of you are green, which is awesome. Um, but there is something we're doing tonight. I'll get to that in a second. My name is Brian. I'm the youth pastor here. It is so awesome to have worshiped with you this morning. I believe there is supposed to be at least another song at the end, so look forward to that too. Um, I just love being able to re kind of sync ourselves up with God, which is what worship is all about, is reconnecting with him. Um, I don't know about you, but I always get a little bit nervous when they do the whole, hey, just the voices. And you're like, ah, I, I, I slept weird. Uh, my voice isn't going to be that great. But you guys sounded amazing. So pat yourselves on the back. Great job. Uh, for tithes and offerings, there are two ways you can give. You can either give physically in the drop box at the back at the end of service, or you can go on our website, picturechurch.org, give tabs in the upper right-hand corner. Um, that is just for people who call VCC home. If you're here checking things out, uh, we are just so glad that you decided to be here. Please feel no obligation to give at all. Um, if you are new, if you want to find out some more stuff that is going on, there is a Connect card in the seat back in front of you, as well as a prayer card. If you're like, hey, I really want you guys to help me by praying for this. Um, here's this awesome thing that happened. Let's thank God for that. You can fill that out for prayers. You can put it in the drop box at the back that says prayer requests. For Connect card, we would love it if you brought that to the Welcome Center. There is a gift there for you. Um, it is the year uh, 2024 which sounds like it's the future. And so we do also have QR codes on your bulletin that you grabbed on your way in for all of that stuff too. If you're like, let's save some trees, let's not use as much paper as uh, we could. So you can do that too. By the way, if you did download the app that we we're using, Church Center, um, there's also a QR code on the bulletin for that too. Um, but for that, if you want to be part of the directory or if you just need help, at all. Uh, Rick Reefer will be at the back at the end of service to help you out. Um, just have your phone in your hand and look very lost, and he will come and find you and help you with whatever it is that you need to have uh, for that. Tonight, for Awake, 6.15 to 8.15, grades 6 through 12th. It is Shamrock Shake Sunday. We are having Shamrock Shakes. Yes! It'll be amazing. Um, and yeah, so wear your green. Come on out. It will be a blast. Uh, Shamrock Shakes are free. So yeah. Just come to that. Um, and we also have some flyers in the back for a youth worship night. It'll be area youth groups. So we are hosting, but a bunch of youth groups are coming here to do a worship night. So all the information is on that. We'll give you more as it gets closer. But come out to Awake tonight. We have our super game night. Um, this is for adults only. Um, kids, we love you. Sometimes it's great also to just have a little bit of a break. And so we are having our adult super game night. So you can bring a, a soup to pass. So bring a, a delicious soup, your best. Bring your A game. 
bring the best soup, not just one that you're trying out. Bring your best one, and you will, will be eating soup. We will be playing a bunch of games. You can bring a game if you would like, but again, information's on the back. We do ask that you sign up just so that we can know what to plan for. We don't want to have not enough chair set up or way too many chairs set up. So sign up if you are able to come, uh, bring a soup or a snack to share for that. Uh, last, certainly not least, uh, Easter is coming up. It is pretty early this year, but our Good Friday service, uh, like we have done many times in the past, we are going to be, again, hosting, but it is multi-church, meaning there's going to be a couple other churches that will be participating in that as well. Um, if you've been in the past, it's always awesome. Yeah, it's good when we get together beyond just our four walls, and we do that with other churches, and recognize that uh, if there's one thing churches should be able to come together around, it's the cross and the sacrifice of Christ. So we're going to do that on Good Friday. Awesome. Yeah, that'll be at 6.30, uh, and it'll be about, just about an hour together and uh, opportunity to celebrate uh, communion as well at that Good Friday service. Well, last week we introduced um, the ministry years of Jesus, and we kind of looked at that first year as the year of inauguration, kind of kicking things off. We looked at the uh, miracle at the wedding in Cana, and uh, today we're going to continue talking about the ministry years of Jesus' life and the kind of that middle year, uh, which we could call the year of popularity. Lots of things happened in that second year. We're not going to look at all of them, but we know that as we just announced the Good Friday service, that this is leading up to the crucifixion and that last time frame in Jesus' earthly ministry, the year of opposition, which we'll kind of hint at uh, at the end of the message this morning. So last week we were in the book of John. Today I want to spend some time in the book of Luke. So if you have a Bible, why don't you turn to that? If you don't, there should be one under a chair around you somewhere, uh, assuming that you want to spend some time in God's Word this morning. Very good. So in uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7 is where we're going to kick it off, all right? And we're going to look at a few um, <clears throat> Things that happen in Jesus' ministry and get some insight into those. We're not going to go, uh, you know, verse by verse through four or five chapters, but we are going to spend some time in chapter 7, some time in chapter 8, and some time in chapter 9. And I think we'll see uh, some, some pretty um, interesting things here as we look at the ministry of Jesus here in this second year um, of his ministry, year of popularity and his you can guess uh, Jesus has been calling some of those disciples together, and we've already begun to see some of the miraculous things that he has done. So we're going to pick it up at chapter 7 and verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all this in, in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. So uh, a high-ranking official, a powerful official, has this servant who's sick. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. So uh, the centurion, who has a servant who's not feeling well, sent some Jewish leaders to Jesus, and they uh, gave him a good recommendation. They're like, yeah, he's a good guy. Like, it would be a good thing for you to do. And so uh, they see that Jesus decides to go with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. Verse 8. Well, hold on. We're going to get to verse 8 in a second. Do you notice the posture of this centurion? And this is a guy who's a powerful guy, right? He's got servants. He's got enough pull that he sent Jewish leaders to go get Jesus. And Jesus came. Like, he, he's got some clout, right? And yet his posture is, I'm not worthy for you to be here, even come into my house. So I, I dare to say, he's got a pretty good attitude about the situation, doesn't he? But that's not the most important, or to me, the most powerful aspect of this. But it's one 
that we need not gloss over. That his attitude was reflective of his understanding of who Jesus was and who he was and that relationship there. His posture wasn't based on his earthly position. And sometimes that's the way we look at things. Well, I'm in a position of power. I've achieved this much or that much. But really, it was about his relationship in light of who Jesus was, right? And that's, by the way, what I, what I would consider proper humility. Proper humility is understanding who I am in light of who God is. See, there's, there's false humility, which is like, oh, I'm, I'm terrible, I'm awful, you know, I'm no good. And really, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, no, I'm, I'm pretty good. Uh, a lack of humility is just, well, I'm awesome. You know, that's just a lack of humility. But true humility is when we understand who we are in light of who God is. And that relationship helps define that. And that this centurion displays that tremendously. A great sense of accurate humility. But there's another thing that he says... He says, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus, just say the word. And then he explains why he understands that. In verse 8, here's what he says. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. So one of the things we talked about last week was in the early part of Jesus' ministry, he was demonstrating his authority, right? You might remember that. He was confirming his identity and demonstrating his authority. And one of the things we see here is that authority is recognized in a significant way by the centurion because the centurion makes the connection. He uses a great object lesson here. He says, I understand authority. I know how that works because I'm under authority and I've got people under me. And I say, go do this, and they do it. I say, go take care of this, and they take care of it. And so when he says to Jesus, just say the word, and my servant will be healed, he's recognizing the tremendous authority that Jesus has. Right? Because he's he says, like, I, I have authority, and I tell my servant, go do this, and, and he does it. My, ser- my servant listens to me. The people I give orders to listen to me because I have that authority. So if you, Jesus, just say the word, that's a done deal. He's recognizing and he is acting on the authority that Jesus has. He's placing his faith in Jesus when he asks him to just say the word. When Jesus heard this, verse 9, he was amazed at him. I don't know about you, but I don't often read in Scripture that Jesus was amazed at something. In fact, it's only recorded twice. Here, at the centurion's belief, and then over a few books, and then one of the other Gospels, at the Jews' unbelief. So it's not a common thing that Jesus is amazed by something. But he's amazed at the conversation with this centurion. And amazed, it says, at him. Turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Jesus recognized that what this centurion was demonstrating was an incredible amount of faith. Because one of the things that was true in Jesus' earthly ministry is he did a lot of miracles. And we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes, actually. But he did a lot, and that was very visible, and he was present at those. But the faith of the centurion recognizes the authority that Jesus has. And he says, if you, if you don't, just say the word. Just say the word, and it will be done. Verse 10 kind of wraps up this story here when it says, Then the men who had been sent, returned to the house, and found the servant well. I mean, would you expect anything different? 
right? Such a great example this centurion is. Such a great object lesson he gives us. And such an affirmation of Jesus' ministry and the fact that not only had Jesus in the early part of his ministry been demonstrating his authority over things, but now people have come to recognize that. And that becomes an avenue by which they express their faith. And that's exactly what the centurion did. Just say the word. Again, when we consider this, we come back to our own faith. Do I believe to that degree? Do I... Does my life reflect faith like that? That I know Jesus can just say the word, he can just exercise his authority and it will be done. I mean, we pray that, right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like we pray things like that. But do we actually believe and expect those things to happen? How have you lately leaned into the fact that Jesus has all authority? I think sometimes we miss that. But the centurion gives us a, a phenomenal example of that. Well, if we move forward a little bit, I mentioned that um, we were going to talk about the miraculous things that Jesus did. If we uh, meander our way over to verse 18 of John, uh, uh, Luke chapter 7, we find John is in prison. And John has been imprisoned by Herod. Herod had arrested John because John had kind of given uh, him a little bit of grief over the fact that he married Herodias, which was his brother's wife. And John said, that's not really, you know, not a good idea. He shouldn't have done that. And so Herod imprisons John. And while John's in prison, the, John's disciples continue to do uh, work and continue to do ministry. In verse 18, John's disciples told him all about these things, all about what was happening with now the, um, the uh, growing ministry of Jesus and uh, the work that had continued uh, in the wake of John the Baptist preparing the way. Verse 19, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who has come, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, isn't this an interesting question from John the Baptist? John the Baptist, who a few chapters earlier had said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And now he's asking his disciples, can you go check with him and see if he's the one? Right? It just seems kind of odd, doesn't it? But let's understand the circumstances. John's been in prison. He's been in prison for a few months, actually. He's been imprisoned, and he's not witnessing all that has been happening while he's been in prison, although he's heard about it. And maybe things aren't playing out quite the way John would have hoped. Maybe, his, maybe he's having a, a crisis of faith there in prison. Maybe he's just wondering. Maybe he's trying to send Jesus a message. Like, hey, did you forget about me in prison over here? Uh, a little help, please? You know, Maybe this is his early phone a friend kind of thing. He's trying to send a message to Jesus like, hey, I'm, I'm here in prison. Like, Are you the guy or is someone else coming? We don't know exactly the nature of it, but he sends the question, verse 20, when the men came to Jesus, they asked, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers. So here's what Jesus says. Send this message back to John. He says, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. And then he says, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. I think that last verse was kind of him saying, John, hang in there. But what's the reason he gives? Does he just say, yeah, take my word for it? He doesn't. If I can sum up what he says in verse 22, it's this. Look at the evidence. Just look at the evidence. Am I the one? Look at the evidence. Look what's happening. And it's interesting because um, when he says that, he seems to give an increasingly impressive list of things. 
culminating with the dead are raised and the good news is preached to the poor. And by the way, all of those things were messianic in nature. So he was, in a way, referring to, yes, look at the promises, look at the fulfillment of Scripture. Yes, yes, I'm the one, take my word for it. Yes, I'm the one, but look at the evidence. And John would have, recogni- or John would have recognized that those things that Jesus was talking about were, were prophesied about the Messiah. And so he's saying, look at the evidence, John, and hang in there. Look at the evidence and hang in there. I think sometimes we need to hear that message too. Because we look at a world that seems all upside down. I was talking with a number of people this week um, about that very dynamic. And as upside down as the world may seem at times, it doesn't change the fact that the evidence is there. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one who came He's still on the throne. God is still in control. And sometimes I think we just need to be reminded to look at the evidence. After John's messengers left, verse 24, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. My guess is that word got back to John, what Jesus said, even though the messengers had left. But in case anybody wondered, oh, look, John's losing his faith. John's mm, too bad about John. Jesus affirmed John and his ministry in this next dialogue. And it's really not much of a dialogue. It's just Jesus speaking about John. Uh, What did you go out into the desert to see? Because John was preaching in the desert. A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it was written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What he's saying is, you know, did, don't you remember you went out to see John? Don't you remember his ministry? He's the one that the prophet spoke about. He's the one that sent the that was sent uh, ahead of me to prepare the way. Jesus again is affirming John the Baptist, who maybe in that moment could have been perceived as falling away or having a, a crisis of faith. Verse twenty nine. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for them. Uh, for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus says, uh, verse 31, to what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread or drinking wine. And you say, he's a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom proved right by all her children. Wisdom is proved right by all her children. What's he saying? Look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. Yes, I am who I claim to be. Look at the evidence. The lame walk, the blind see. The dead are raised and the gospel is preached to the poor. And by the way, about John, look at the evidence. He's the one that was sent before me that the prophet spoke about. He comes to the defense of John the Baptist in that. And once again, we see Jesus affirming John the Baptist. Hmm. We'll fast forward a little bit. Fast forward to chapter 8. In chapter 8, Jesus is preaching. He's teaching in parables. Notice what it says in verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus actually made three journeys through Galilee. 
And this is the second of those, and it's simply marking that. And I bring that up. It's significant when we get to the third journey, which we'll talk about at the end of the message here in just a few minutes. So this is the second time, the second go-around through Galilee. And Jesus is teaching the crowd. And this is, for those who have studied Scripture, uh, you, you've probably studied this or you've heard about you know, the, the parable of the sower and the seed, or some refer to it as the soils, but it's really about the sower and the seed and the soils. And so let's take a look at that. Beginning at verse 4, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town to town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow, uh, sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. When he had said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so Jesus gives this uh, parable, he gives this illustrative story, this allegory about the sower and the seed and the soil. And it's no wonder that he used this picture, this object lesson, because he was speaking to primarily an agricultural uh, agricultural society, agricultural culture. And so they would have understood sowing seeds. I mean, we're in a time of year where maybe we understand that, right? So how many have been, anybody been planting anything yet lately? A few people? Yeah. I don't do a lot of planting. Um, I like to do a lot of harvesting, so I'll, like, I'll, like, I'll, like, I'll eat stuff, right? Uh, but uh, not a lot of planting necessarily, but in that culture, that would have been the norm. They would have understood the significance of seed and what soil it's in. And then he says... Verse 9, his disciples came and asked what this parable meant. It's interesting. They were like, we know there's something here. This isn't just about some farmer planting seeds, right? There's more to it than that. Verse 10, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. So Jesus is very blunt here. This is what it means. Don't you wish sometimes that every part of Scripture had a clear explanation, right? Like, hey, I I don't get this. Okay, let me tell you exactly what it means. Like, that would have been great if Jesus did that. But it says, and Jesus says, you know, I speak in parables because not everybody's going to get it. And, but I'm going to explain it to you. And and that's what we get the advantage of here. We get that insight. This is the meaning of the parable. So if you're ever reading Scripture, you're like, what does this mean? What does this refer to? What is this symbolic of? Jesus lays it out right here. The seed is the word of God. So the seed that's being sown is the gospel. The gospel's going out, right? The gospel's being preached. The gospel's being shared with folks. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. So, referencing here the fact that, you know, we're, we're in a battle, right? There's a spiritual battle that's going on. There's, there's spiritual warfare that's happening, and uh, the Satan works in direct opposition to what God is doing. And in some ways, if, if the word doesn't find any place to find root, then it gets taken up, it gets taken away. It's interesting that all four of the groups of people that are mentioned here, all four hear the gospel. You might say, well, is that an issue with the gospel then? I mean, is the gospel not powerful? Because it certainly has different outcomes. Well, no, because it's not about the gospel, right? It's really about the soil. It's really about where the gospel goes. And the challenge has always been, as we think about this parable, is what kind of reception does the gospel get in my own life? Does it fall on a hard surface where there's no way it can find root and then it's just blown away by the wind or eaten up by the birds? You know, what is the soil of my soul, so to speak? But let's keep reading. 
Uh, those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. There's no root. Nothing really takes hold. There's an excitement, but nothing really takes hold. Verse 14, the seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. So the seed begins to take root, but there's a lack of focus and discipline in the life that ends up not growing because there are other things that take priority, other things that seem more important, other things that choke out. And when we say choke out, when we're talking about choking out, we're talking about using up resources that would have normally been used for healthy processes otherwise. That's what the choking out is. So do I spend my time fostering my relationship with Christ and my spiritual growth, or do I spend it in other ways? Do I remove distractions because they take away from my opportunity for God to be at work in my life and in my heart? Or do I just have myself be all over the place? Those are some of those choking out things. And it's not to say that we shirk responsibility because, well, you know, could I be at work or could I be studying my Bible? Like, that's not, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about those things that take away unnecessarily. One of the things that um, we're about to do, actually, we already, Alex, we already did, right? Episode one is out. Yeah. So we mentioned at Vision Night that we are um, trying to do more um, in, the, in the digital realm of kind of raising the bar digitally. And so we uh, launched this past week two podcasts, right? Is that accurate, too? I'm announcing this on the fly, so... Um, one is the Sunday message, which is available in podcast form as opposed, well, alongside the fact that we do the live stream and that. And the other is a podcast that we've just called Conversations About Meaningful Things. And it's, uh, currently it's Alex, Brian, and I, and we're just talking about things that are meaningful and inviting others to sit in on that conversation. We're going to have some interviews with folks. And um, just a way maybe for you to, to lean into that a little bit, but also maybe to invite others to lean into that as well um, and have a way of kind of introducing to the church family a little bit. So um, I know I had a point for saying this. I'm trying to remember what it was, but I, th I think I can remember. Um, on one of the episodes coming up, we're going to talk about this very dynamic about distractions and focus and priority. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the parable of the sower, the seed, and the soil. He, he's kind of saying that, you know, our response to the gospel is varied based on the soil of our heart and mind and our souls. And there may be, you know, some of us in here who recognize, yeah, there was, there was lots of time in my life where, you know, the gospel was like falling on, falling on the, the path, like there was no opportunity it was just blown away by the wind or eaten up by the, by the birds. Like there was no opportunity for any kind of taking root in my life. Or maybe there's times where, yeah, I was excited about God and the gospel and excited about Jesus, but no, not, not, not much beyond that. Nothing ever really happened. Sometimes you might hear people say like, yeah, I tried that Christianity thing and it didn't work. And some of us at times struggle with the gospel finding root, but man, there's so much competition for those resources and things can get choked out a little bit. And then he talks about, in verse 15, the good soil. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by perseverance produce a crop. So is he elevating those who... Um, have a, have a noble and good heart. I think he's just pointing out that when we are truly receptive to the gospel and 
our hearts are in the right place, we desire that relationship, that there's benefit and produce. There's fruit that comes from that. And I know many in this room, many have experienced that firsthand. Hopefully all of us will where we recognize God's been at work in my life and I see the evidence of it. And Jesus is giving the disciples some special insight into how ministry works, so to speak. Because he's about to do something in the next chapter that is significant. He's about to send them out. He's about to empower and send them. And he's giving them insight into how the gospel is received at times. So let's fast forward, and I'm emphasizing fast when I say forward, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So there's a shift that happens. This is a Kind of, this is the third time, the third time going through Galilee, but this time he is sending the disciples, which is a shift. And we see a pattern here, which I'll point out in just a second, but this time he empowers and sends the disciples to do what they had seen him do, what they had helped him do, and now he's giving them a special empowerment, an empowerment that maybe is uh, like what happened in chapter 8, which we didn't look at, but when that woman touched the edge of his garment, the edge of his coat, and he said, I've felt power go from me. What, who touched my coat? And he's in a crowd. I imagine the disciples were a lot, there's a lot of people touching him. And he said, no, 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 there's just, there's just something that happened. And that's that empowerment um, that I believe he's talking about here in chapter 9. So uh, this is the instruction he gave them in, in verse 3. Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. This was the third time through Galilee, but this time it was different. This time Jesus had empowered and sent the disciples to do the ministry. He sent them and said, don't take anything with you. And by taking nothing, they were completely dependent on the people that were hosting them. They weren't distracted by the baggage they had to carry, but they were just completely dependent on those who were partners in the kingdom work, providing for them as they went. And then he says something interesting. He says, if people don't welcome you, shake the dust off your feet as you leave the town. Now that was a, a, a very specific thing. It was a sign of, of spurning or rejecting the response of those people. And it was almost as if you're walking out of town saying, I'm, you're not even worthy for me to carry the dust of your town with me as I leave. And so taking very seriously the task and the responsibility and the sending to do ministry. And we see this a transition towards the end of that second year of public ministry where now it's not just uh, Jesus doing what he does, but he's transitioning ministry to the disciples. And here's the pattern of leadership that we see here, all right? First, go ahead and throw that up. Uh, first, we see that he called some to observe him. In that first journey through Galilee, there were four disciples that went with him. Then um, he had those that went with him and they assisted. And you, we see that in some of the miracles that Jesus did and performed. Uh, we see the disciples there assisting. And then the third thing, he sent them all out. And that's what we see in this third journey here. And so my question for us this morning is this, for you this morning is this. Um, as you see that pattern of ministry and ministry leadership in the ministry of Jesus... We have to recognize that's still the same today. That pattern still exists. Jesus invites us to observe what he's doing, invites us to come and see. And there may be some here who are in that 
They're, they're checking Jesus out. They're checking to see the ministry out. They're coming to see. And then there are those that are called to assist. Hey, I'm, I'm helping. I'm a part of what's going on. And then I believe there are some who are, are empowered and sent. And my question is, where are you in that process? As we see the ministry of Jesus unfolding and we see what he's doing, and we learn from the centurion um, how he leaned into the authority of Jesus, we see the, the affirmation that Jesus provided when John uh, Faith maybe waned a little bit, but he said, just look at the evidence. We sometimes need to be reminded in a world that seems upside down. Just, we need just be reminded of the evidence. We recognize the self-inspection nature of considering the soils. And, and how receptive am I to the gospel in my life? And then we see the sending of the twelve. And we, ask, we have to ask ourselves, where am I in that? Am I simply observing? Am I, am I helping? Am I, am I part of the kingdom work? Or do I feel that God has really empowered and sent me to carry the message of the gospel forward? I believe probably all three of those are represented in a group of people like this this morning. And don't mistake being called to observe as something less than being asked to assist, being less than something that's called and sent. What that simply reminds us of is that we're all in process. We're all in that relationship with God where he's at work in different ways in our lives. And if there's any one thing that we should not miss when it comes to the ministry of Jesus is that he was willing and able and did work in people's lives as they gave him opportunity. And so this morning, what opportunity do you give the Lord to be at work in your life? Let's pray together. Father, this morning as we come before you, we are just... And we're reminded of the ministry of Jesus, but we're awed by some of those aspects of it. Awed by how he could speak into the lives of people, how he could be at work demonstrating his authority, but also we're challenged by the response of those who experienced that ministry firsthand as Jesus was here on earth. God, I pray that you would help us as we consider our response to your ministry in our lives personally. Lord, where we can see you at work, where we've been invited in to be a part of it, where we're being sent out. Um, Lord, help us in those moments. Lord, we're grateful. Grateful for your work here on earth and grateful for your work here in our lives even today. We pray that you would continue that today, into this week, as we continue to walk out our faith. In Christ's name, amen. And with us, we give our praise back to him this morning.
We thank you that all those years ago, Jesus, you had a plan. You had a plan to start this movement of faith through the gospel and through your sacrifice on the cross. And we're here today because of that. Lord, let us never, let us never let that become common to us, God, but that we would share that hope that we have with the world around us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, guys, it was wonderful getting to worship with you this morning. Just wanted to remind you, if you're here and uh, need some extra prayer, we'll have prayer partners up here at the front who would love to talk with you and pray with you. Um, Also, if you're trying to figure out Church Center and are not sure how to or need some help with that, uh, Rick Reefer will be in the back as well. He would love to assist you with that. But you guys have an incredible week. We'll see you soon.